I don't live in darkness. It's the darkness that lives in me. <laughs> this is something that genuinely happened to my friends and I. Now, whether you actually believe in the paranormal or just enjoy listening to the spooky stories in an attempt to scare yourself, this is one of the many paranormal experiences I've had, arguably the most terrifying, converting one of the eyewitnesses from a skeptic to completely believing in the paranormal and actually taking it seriously. My friends and I have always been quite fond of going out urban exploring. For those of you that don't know what that is, it's when you go out and look for abandoned and derelict buildings to explore and photograph. We didn't go out searching for the haunted side of things. We just enjoyed the eeriness and also the beauty of old abandoned places. Living in Scotland, a lot of these abandoned places are normally surrounded by amazing scenery, from hills and mountains to thick forests and lush fields. So we always made a day out of it when we did go exploring. One house in particular was our favorite. So much so, we had already visited a couple of times prior to this experience. Myself and two of my best friends, we will call them Carl and Beth, decided to go back but the condition of the place had declined quite rapidly since the last time we had been and everything seemed very unstable, but we didn't let that stop us. Finding that our usual entry spot had been boarded up, we felt quite defeated, but decided to look for another entry anyway. After searching around for a while, we noticed that the roof on one of the towers, on one of the lower parts of the house, had been damaged by fire and was practically all gone. It wasn't the easiest to get up to, using a tree and each other to do so, but we finally got in. It was going relatively normal. We were wandering around the inside, searching and admiring the rooms we could still get into, being terrified by the occasional bird being spooked by our footsteps, and taking photos of the amazing architecture However, something was different this time. The whole place felt off and a little more eerie than it normally did. I've always been what you would describe as spiritually inclined, so I felt this more than what my friends did. One of them was a complete skeptic, so he just brushed it off and said we were over-exaggerating and making things up. His mind was going to be completely changed after leaving this house. After exploring the top three floors as much as we could, cringing at the spray paint art the vandals had left, we were on the ground floor, just having a chat and discussing how much the house's condition had really declined. We were standing in one of the hallways, almost in a triangle formation. I was standing on a door frame with my back towards the empty room, with Carl to my left and Beth to my right. I was still feeling a little uneasy, but I didn't give much thought to it. As we were all conversing about the plans for the rest of the day, I felt something on my back. It felt like someone had run their hand down my back. From the base of my neck to the center of my back, I felt a firm, constant pressure until the pressure tapered off down to the base of my back. It was over within seconds. I felt all the color drain from my face as I frantically jumped forward with a scream. Beth and Carl both looked at me in confusion and asked what happened and if I had hurt myself. In a haze of confusion and dizziness, I wasn't able to form any words, never mind describing what I had just felt. 
I regained my bearings and took a couple of deep breaths before trying my best to explain the sensation of being touched. Beth's face turned a little pale as she saw how serious I was being. However, Carl was a skeptic. He laughed and thought I was joking or that I had accidentally hit something without realizing or a bug had hit me. I knew that wasn't the case because for a split second before it happened, I felt every single hair on my body stand up as a warning to what was about to happen. Being slightly freaked out, Beth and myself managed to convince Carl that it was time to leave. On top of what had just happened, it was also getting a little cold. While making our way to the same section we had ended through, I started to feel a burning sensation run down my back. Like someone had taken hot coals or a flame down my back. Starting to freak out again, I asked Beth to check if anything was there. Asking her what was wrong, I automatically knew something was wrong because she didn't give me a response. She was just silent. Next thing I knew, Beth was calling over Carl to come look, which made my anxiety spike up more. From the look on Carl's face, I became increasingly worried. They both nervously told me that there were marks going down my back. Obviously not being able to see the back myself, I then asked them to take a photo for me to see. Looking at the photo, there were three distinctive scratches going down my back, exactly where I had felt someone or something touching me. Looking at that photo still gives me uneasy feelings to this day. At first, Carl was convinced I had done it myself, or caught myself on something. But after examining the scratches more, he determined that it couldn't have been. The scratches went under my bra strap, which would have been impossible for me to do without them noticing. At this point, we were all trying to keep our calm while internally freaking out. We tried to make our way out as quick as we could without injuring ourselves. Climbing back over the wall of the house and through the hole where the roof used to be, we collectively walked a few feet away from the house and stopped to look back at it. Still trying to understand what had just happened, we all agreed that we'd go back to the car and never come back here. The walk back to the car, which took around 20 minutes, was relatively uneventful, apart from a continuous, uneasy feeling that we were being watched or followed, and occasionally thinking we could hear footsteps behind us, it was actually quite peaceful, taking in the Scottish countryside. We got to the car where we sat and had a smoke, still trying to completely calm ourselves down. It's safe to say that, after that day, Carl took a long time to process the events, but undoubtedly became a believer. We swore to never come back to this house, but for some reason, we're always drawn back to it. It's like an urge to come back and visit, like an itch that you can't quite scratch. Maybe we're just drawn in by the eeriness, or the mystery around that day, or maybe it's something more than that. Me and my male friends decided to go to Scotland for a camping trip with around 30 individuals, all guys. Considering we were travelling from Ireland to the Scottish Highlands in Lanark, this was a proper trip that no girl volunteered for. Too wet, too windy and all of that. So long story short, or as short as I can make it, we arrived and pitched our tents and set up for the first night. It took us longer than expected to get there, so we literally had to put our tents up in the dark while raining sideways. I noticed that my tent was missing a ground sheet, that square bit that goes under your tent. That was missing. I found it the next day. I yelled out, Balls, I can't find my ground sheet. A close friend called Brian 
said to jump in the tent with him, which was already set up, which turned out to maybe be the best thing I've ever done because I don't know if I could have experienced this on my own and I'm so glad Brian was there to experience what happened with me. What I'm about to describe came straight out of the blue. We both laid side by side trying to sleep while hearing the howling wind and rain smashing into the tent. It was a proper mountain tent, so it was actually cozy. That's until I heard it. We both did. Everything went quiet. I mean everything. All the audio went mute. It was so strange. No wind, no rain, nothing. Then a little girl laughed loudly for about 30 seconds. It was so creepy, it's hard to describe. Clear as day, right outside our tent. She actually sounded around six or seven because at the time I had a younger sister, roughly the same age. I'm in my 30s now, and I was around 18 or 19 when this happened. It was a disturbing laugh. I mean, right at the door, a thin layer between us and it. Although I couldn't see her, I have never felt so scared. The feeling and sensation I was getting was so bad. I've never felt that uncomfortable before, ever. My entire body turned to ice and locked up in fear. It was a joyous laugh mixed with playful and sinister all at once. When she stopped laughing, it wasn't a fade away laugh, as if she was running away. It just stopped in mid laugh completely. Immediately, both of us looked at each other and I said, Brian, did you just hear that? Yeah, the girl laughing, he replied. We did not think paranormal right away, and we both actually thought a girl was outside at 2 a.m. in the Highlands of Scotland lost, needing help. So we both panicked and bounced out to see nothing but surrounded by rolling black hills. We got out of the tent in about 30 seconds and no one could have gotten down them highlands that quick. We both got this fear that stuck us together, and we jumped back into the tent. Don't know how long we lay there for dreading it would come back to laugh. To this day, Brian and I have never felt a fear like that before. We later discovered that those very hills were the hills where the innocent women and children were murdered during a Scottish civil war in the 1290s. When we visited Edinburgh, there was a tour that would take you to Greyfriars Kirkyard. There was, at the time, only one tour company that was granted access to this particular mausoleum. We entered into the locked Kirkyard and went through a second set of locked gates and then were ushered into the mausoleum. The caveat for allowing this company access was that people could only stay in the structure for a short time. It was either 9 or 15 minutes. It was October and already dark when we got there. The flashlight that I had brought was brand new with new batteries, but kept going on and off on its own while we were in the cemetery. Once in the stone building, my friend and I gathered at the back, behind the rest of the tour and against the wall, farthest from the doorway. It was empty of everything, save for the dead leaves that would blow through the door. The tour guide was telling stories of the poltergeist that haunts there, the injuries that had been incurred by visitors, scratches on their stomachs and backs, and other ghostly goings on within the area. I was listening and loving it. To my right, on the far side of my friend, in the corner, there came the sound of a rapping. Knock, knock, knock. I looked at my friend to laugh, as though it was either her or someone in front of her doing it. She was still intently listening to the guide. I looked around the crowd. No one else was looking around for the source of the very distinct noise. I turned back to the guide. Knock. 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 I looked around again. There is no way that my friend or anyone near us wouldn't have heard it. But, again, no one seemed to even notice. I was still looking to the corner where it sounded like it originated. Knock. 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 
I kept my head trained in that direction. My friend gave me a weird look but didn't say anything, as the guide was still telling stories. There were no other sounds after the third set. We were taken out and told to report and photograph any injuries or scratches that may appear overnight, and we were let out. I told my friend what I had heard. Someone had been knocking on the wall. Now, the mausoleum is made of stone and rocks. I wouldn't have heard the noise the same if it had been made from someone outside the walls. This was knuckles on stone, a foot or two away. We started talking to some others as we walked back to the street and no one heard a thing. There's also a hostel in Pitlokri, which used to be a hotel. On the night we stayed there, we came back from the pub across the street and all went off to our separate quarters. We were on a tour at the time with Mac Backpackers and our tour guide, Ewan, who was an absolute dream in any and all senses of the word, shuffled off down a different hallway as staff stayed in a different area than guests. The next morning, he said he had a hell of a time getting to sleep because something was moving around and kept walking to and fro in front of his bedroom door. The hostel is apparently haunted and he was sure it was the ghost. I believe him. He looked like he hadn't slept and wound up telling me the story when there wasn't an audience to impress. Not that this is a ghost story, but when we visited Kaludan to see the battlefield and I stood on ground there looking around, I was absolutely overcome with this oppressive, heavy feeling. I started bawling right then and there. Now, the thing is, Ewan hadn't told us the details yet. I had no reason to get overly emotional. I've also grown up on horror movies, true crime books, and shows on serial killers, mass executions, stories about genocide, etc. I've always really liked to learn about the darker side of humanity, I suppose. I'm not easily moved by tales of people dying, etc. And while I admit I do cry sometimes, I do not cry out in the open for people to see. I save that for when I'm alone. Or I can cry quietly and in such a way that people don't even know. And here I was, with a sob ripped out of me in front of a gaggle of people. I can't describe it, but whatever energy or past actions or whatever you want to call it, sits on that field. It was tangible to me. I felt it. It was almost enough to make me feel sick to my stomach. I had to excuse myself and went back to the bus. I think that's all I have from Scotland. It was bordering autumn to winter, if I remember correctly. Unfortunately, I don't remember the exact date, but I know it was cold out and I was in bed with my dog Millie. At the time, the only way for me to watch TV in my room was to connect my laptop to the TV via an HDMI cable. I was falling asleep and instead of leaving the laptop balanced at the foot of my bed, I turned it off. I never sleep with lights on. I've always had to have the TV running for light and background noise. I picked the habit up from my mum, who does the same to keep herself from having night terrors. But because I'd had an instance not long before where I kicked the laptop off the bed in my sleep, I figured I was close enough to falling asleep that I could bear the darkness for a few minutes. I was just dropping off, and everything was fine, until my dog bolted up at the foot of my bed. She's a little thing, but she's a protective little thing. And that night, I truly think she saw someone or something. Of course, I jumped right out of my skin. There was something so frightening about the way she'd gone from being totally asleep to on all fours, guarding me from something in the open door that led to the hallway. It's important to mention that I live separate from the rest of my family. The only way to access my room is through a set of stairs outside. My first instinct was to try and hush her. It was late and I didn't want to wake my family or our neighbours. But she would not back down and I finally forced myself to look 
at whatever it was she was protecting me from. And there wasn't anything there. Not that I could see in the darkness, with the only light I had coming from the mostly closed shutters behind my head. But I kept my eyes glued there, like I knew I couldn't take them away or I'd miss something. And that's when I noticed just how dark the space looked. Darker than what felt right. And when I realized that, I felt a chill all over my body. I felt fear and dread wash over me like I never have before. And the shocking feel of it was, thankfully, what made me spring across the bed to turn on the light at the opposite side of the foot of my bed. I spent the rest of my night sat up with Millie in my lap, just staring at the partially visible doorway with the lights on. I didn't want to move. I don't want to shut the door or make a noise, so I just watched all night, terrified that whatever was there would come back. I should mention that while we aren't a particularly spiritual family, we have had many encounters seeing spirits, and my mother was told by a medium that she met that we have family looking over us, which I find comforting. But whatever was there that night was no family member or good spirit. I truly believe that whatever it was, was evil. That it chose to show itself, when I was in such a dark place mentally too, doesn't help either. All I can give as a conclusion to this story is that I haven't seen it since. I've changed the layout of my room, so I can see the hallway door from my bed, and I never go to bed with it open. My mental state is a lot better now too, and while I still have the occasional thing go missing, thanks to a spirit my friend unintentionally passed on to me, I can't complain with that. I usually just ask for it back, and it'll reappear. Hello watchers and listeners, thank you so much for watching. A huge thank you to Mortis Media for joining me on this one. I truly do feel so lucky to have so many great narrators agree to join me on my channel. If you want to help support this channel, you will find links to both my Patreon and my Teespring store in the description below. So feel free to have a look. As always, a big thank you to all of the Reddit users who kindly allowed me to use their stories. And the biggest thank you to all of you who continue to support me. I truly do appreciate it. And remember, Papa loves you.